I'm Don Crafton, the interim director of the Nanovic Institute. And this afternoon, it's certainly my pleasure to welcome you to the Terence R. Keeley Vatican Lecture. There's one preliminary announcement before today's talk. For that, I would like to introduce Robert Krieg, professor of theology. Thank you. Thank you, Don. I have just a couple of brief announcements for this wonderful occasion. We would like everyone to know that in 1983, the internationally respected theologian Walter Casper visited the University of Notre Dame for the first time. That's 30 years ago. And gave his first lecture here in this very auditorium. Over these 30 years, he has returned to campus numerous times and also visited the university's institute, ecumenical institute, at Tantour outside Jerusalem. This afternoon, we are honored, honored to welcome Cardinal Casper here once again. This event is, in fact, the first of three. The third event will occur on Saturday at 5 p.m. when Cardinal Casper presides and preaches at Mass in the Basilica of the Sacred Heart. The second event is the conference in honor of Cardinal Casper. This conference will begin tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. in the McKenna Center and end on Saturday at noon. All of you are, of course, welcome to join us at the Mass and also at the conference, and we hope you will come. One request. If you have come to campus from afar for tomorrow's conference, that is, all of you who have driven or flown in to attend from out of town, scholars, students, pastoral leaders, please meet me right after this lecture out in the concourse, and I will lead those of us who wish to go to the student center where there's a food court, and we can anticipate tomorrow's conference. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thanks. The Keeley Vatican Lecture is a particular and significant initiative brought to us by the vision and generosity of Terry Keeley, who is with us today and joined by his father. Terry was kind enough to contribute this significant lecture to the Nanovic Institute for European Studies, whose principal benefactors, Bob and Liz Nanovic, are also with us today. Before I say a few more words about the Keeley Vatican Lecture and its particular importance, I want to take a moment, if I may, to recognize Bob and Liz. So please hear me out. As the interim director, I've had one year, which is nearing its conclusion, to steward the Nanovic Institute and to oversee its many diverse operations. I can say that it is impressive and successful in many ways, but the heart of the Nanovic is and will remain what I understand uh, Bob often says, let's do something for the kids. <laughs> Our grant programs send these kids and graduate students, scholars in formation all across Europe to conferences, to archives, and when we can't send them to, to Europe, we do our best to bring Europe to them by bringing our special cultural events and visitors like tonight's most honored guest here to Notre Dame. Bob and Liz, look around you. You will see many students who have benefited from your generosity. You will see their faculty advisors, their teachers. You will see alumni who have benefited from your generosity. So thank you so much from all of us. Tonight we're graced with the Keeley Lecture. Terry Keeley's particular vision ensured that when we think about Europe, this focus includes the Vatican, Vatican culture, and of course, Notre Dame's Catholic heritage. Through Terry's generosity, we have been able to welcome a number of cardinals and Vatican officials 
who continue to play important roles in the church today. These lectures have grown in significance, particularly as many of the past lectures, whose presentations are available on the Nanovic website, by the way, have advanced in the curia and in service to the church. This year's distinguished Keeley lecture is no exception, as you'll see. Now, there will be time for questions after the talk, and you'll see these microphones here. Uh, we ask that you come up to the mic. Don't be shy. You're among friends. And um, it's our custom to invite students up first. So especially you students, take some copious notes and kick it off afterwards. So um, while we're doing that, um, let me introduce today's, uh, to introduce today's speaker, I want to welcome Father Bill Lees, Notre Dame's Vice President for Mission Engagement and Church Affairs. Father. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I want to thank Don, and I want to add my thank you to his, uh, to Mr. Keeley, and to the Nanovics for all they've done. Friends, it's my privilege today to introduce the 2013 Keeley Vatican Lecturer, His Eminence Cardinal Walter Casper. There is so much that could be said about tonight's lecturer, but I will begin with the words of Pope Francis, who less than a week into his pontificate said in his first Angelus message, and I quote him, in these days I have been able to read a book by a cardinal, Cardinal Casper, a talented theologian, a good theologian, on mercy, and it did me such good, that book." End of quote. The book the Pope referred to was published in 2012 under the German title Barmherzigkeit, which means mercy, though my grandmother, who was German, probably couldn't recognize my German. <laughs> and is just one of over 50 books and many, many more articles that he has written. He has also served as president of the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity, chairman of the Pontifical Commission for Religious Relations with the Jews, and professor of dogmatic theology at the University of Tübingen. He served as Bishop of Rottenburg, Rottenburg Stuttgart in Germany, and was elevated to Cardinal by Pope John Paul II, Throughout his career, he has received a number of honors, including a 2002 doct uh, honorary doctorate from the University of Notre Dame, no doubt his most prized honor of all. <laughs> <laughs> Service in such significant positions is so important and impressive, as is to write so many books that make an impact on their field of study, which Cardinal Casper truly has and which a campus conference commencing tomorrow will celebrate. But more than just impacting a field, Cardinal Casper has spoken truth in love, the phrase he used to dedicate his Episcopal ministry in 1989. To all, touching even our current Pope. Pope Francis, in that first Angelus message, went on to note that Cardinal Casper, and I quote him, said that hearing the word mercy changes everything. It is the best thing we can hear. It changes the world. A bit of mercy makes the world less cold and more just." End of quote. We hope and we pray that Cardinal Casper's visit to Notre Dame can touch each of us, speak truth in love to us, and change us for the better. His lecture today is on the origins of Vatican II. Please join me in welcoming Cardinal Casper. First of all, I want to express my deep gratitude for your warm-hearted welcome to me. I want to thank 
you for this uh, very prestigious invitation to this uh, Vatican, Keely Vatican lectures. I want to greet the family Keely, family Nenovich and Berner, who contributed for this very important event. And I want to express also my gratefulness for all who prepared this event. For me, it's an opportunity to return once again to this famous university where I was several times in the past, where I have many good memories and very many good friends. And to have friends is one of the most important things in life. And I celebrated now my 80th birthday and I had to commemorate so many friends here in the States and also here in Notre Dame University. When I know I'm speaking about Vatican II, it's not speaking about anything what is strange or far from me. It's a part of my life. It's a permanent reference point of my life and of doing theology. The evening of the 25th January 1959 has remained fixed in my memory. I was at this time a young priest. Then I was listening to the radio news with some friends, TV, young people cannot understand it, did not exist at this time, <laughs> at least not in Europe, in Germany. We could not believe our ears when we heard that Pope John XXIII had convened a federal council that day. That was like a lightning from a blue sky. After the Second Vatican War, I had grown up in the Catholic youth movement at, of that time. There I heard about and absorbed the concerns of the liturgical movement, the biblical movement, and the beginnings of the ecumenical movement. During my studies in Tübingen, I learned from the great theologians of the Tübingen school of the 19th century and that tradition had to be, has to be understood not as, not as a static, but as a real living tradition and reality. Pope Pius XII, it was my first audience I had in 1952. I never thought that I will return in the Vatican. <laughs> he was highly respected in Germany, and he opened the doors to many renewals with his encyclicals of on the church, about the Bible, and about liturgy. But towards the end of this pontificate, we felt the stagnation. Nevertheless, we held, had great, hope, great hopes and expectations, but none of us had ever dreamed of a council. The sense of a new start, the discussions and the enthusiasm that the Pope's announcement stimulated is hard for young people today to imagine. When I was studying theology at Tübingen University from 1952 to 56, it was forbidden to us students to attend lectures in the Protestant theological faculty. But because it was forbidden, it was of course also enticing. <laughs> but now it was as though a dam had been opened. Everything happened in a rush. We met Protestant theologians and talked with the whole, the whole light long, and we kept hearing news from Rome that the forces in the Roman, Roman Curia were trying to quickly blow out the little light of progress that had been lit. And then, on the 11th of October 1962, this time still in front of a TV. We were relieved and enthusiastic once more as we heard the Pope John XXIII opening address in which he warned against the prophets of doom and spoke of an adjournment of the church. For my generation, 
The Council has remained a formative influence until this day. The experience of that day, of this that time, have remained a fixed point of reference for my theological thinking. But for most people today, the Council has long been past history. All who are younger than 60 years did not consciously experience the new departure of these days. For them, the Council belongs to another age and another world. It was the age of the Cold War. A year before the start of the Council, the Berlin Wall was built. And during the first session of the, the Cuba crisis, took the world to the brink of a nuclear war. In that situation, Pope John XXIII published his famous encyclical Patsen in Terris, Peace on Earth. Today, 50 years later, we live in a totally different and a rapidly changing globalized world with many new challenges. The optimistic belief in progress of these days and the spirit of a new departure towards new boundaries which pervaded the Kennedy era have disappeared long ago. For most Catholics, the development set in train by the Council, such as the liturgical renewal, have become part of the everyday life of the Church. But what we now experience, at least in Europe, is not a great new departure and not the springtime of the church that we expected then. But instead, a stagnating church with signs of crisis. Now many are in the hope, have the hope, that the new pontiff Francis, who calls himself, and that's important, Bishop of Rome, will bring back enthusiasm and vision to the future. Already in the last year, in connection with the Jubilee of the Council, there has been a lot of talk about the Council. People are asking, where do we go from here? Back or before the Council or forward beyond it? Pope John Paul II and Pope Benedict XVI both called the Council a trustworthy compass for the cause of the Church in the 21st century. But the needle of the compass is still wavering restlessly. With a little exaggeration, a Roman newspaper in 2005 published an article on the 40th anniversary of the closing of the council with the headline, A Guerra sul Concilio. It is a war about the council. In the German newspaper, said something similar. There is a battle raging over the liberal agenda of the Council. It is clear that the interpretation of the Council is disputed in many respects, and that the Council has left as an agenda that is still a long way from being completely worked through. Anyone who knows the history of the 20 Council recognized as ecumenical will hardly be surprised. Post-conciliar times were almost always turbulent times. Think of the Aryan controversies following the first General Council of Nicaea or the secession of the Oriental Orthodox churches after the Council of Chalcedon in the 5th century. Most councils were only able to prevail after a difficult reception process. In the case of the Second Vatican Council, it is not different. But the Second Vatican Council is still a special case. Unlike the previous councils, it was not called to discern false doctrine or to reconcile a schism. It did not proclaim any formal dogma or pass any formal disciplinary resolutions. John XXIII had a much more comprehensive perspective. He did not want any condemnations or eliminations. Instead, 
he saw the coming of a new age and sought an adornamento of the church, bringing it up to date. But that did not mean a tribal conformity to the spirit of the times. He spoke of a pastoral goal of the council. It was meant to express the traditional faith of the church, whose abiding validity he left no doubt about. In a new contemporary form, so that it could reach people's hearts and shed light on the problems of the day. Lumen gentium, the light of nations, were the opening words of the constitution of the church. Christ should once more be the light of the peoples of the world. The church is to share the gold human space, the joy and hope, the sorrows and fears of humanity, especially the poor and ex ex oppressed. The overwhelming majority of the council fathers grasp this vision. For them, the pastoral intention did not mean that they wished to deny its dogmatic character. Even though the council did not proclaim a new dogma, the intention was to speak of the faith in an authentic magisterial binding manner and renew it. In view of the science of the time, they wanted to proceed from the sacred scripture and of the tradition of the first millennium and not to see the church in the first instance as an institution or organization, but as a mystery, as a people of God, the body of Christ, the house of the spirit. They wanted the liturgy to be understood not simply as a solemn and sacral rite, but as a representation of the paschal mystery of Christ, with the active participation of the whole people of Christ. They wanted to overcome the Constantinian era of the symbiosis of church and state, the one-sided anti-reform and anti-modernist mentality of the last centuries, and take up the concerns of the biblical, liturgical, patristic, pastoral, and ecumenical renewal movements between, <coughs> between the two world wars to open a new character, chapter in the burdened history of the church with Judaism and to enter into dialogue with the other religions and with the modern culture. It was a certain, to a certain extent a modernization program, but that did not want to be a modernism but a renewal from the sources. Pope John Paul II made the point precisely in his program for the third millennium. He said it involved a repartire da Cristo, a new departure with Christ as the starting point. That was a fascinating program. An influential minority, however, resolutely opposed this attempt by the majority. They remained captive to the structure of neo-scholasticism and defended the post tridentine tradition in a one-sided manner. The successor of to John XXIII, Pope Paul VI, and justly a too much forgotten Pope, was in principle inclined towards the concerns of the majority, but sought following Asian conciliar tradition, to achieve at all as possible a united consensus on the passing of the council documents. He succeeded. All 16 documents were passed almost unanimously, but that came at a cost. In many places, as in previous councils, compromise formulations had to be found in which the position of the majority often stands directly side by side with the position of the minority with their concern of demarcation. So the council texts remain, uh, contain enormous conflict potential. They open the door 
for a selective reception in one or the other direction. Vatican II is a council of transition. It wanted renewal without giving up the old. And for this synthesis of old and new, however, the council could only set the framework for the post-conciliar reception. So the question arises, in which direction does the compass of the council point and where is the church heading in this still young third millennium? Will it remain to the confident trust of John XXIII and the renewal from the source or take the path back to defensive anti-reform and anti-modernist attitudes? That is a question facing post-conciliar reception. Now section two sees three phases of reception. We can distinguish three overlapping phases of reception. At first, there was a phase of enthusiasm. In a lecture immediately after his return from the council, Karl Rahn, a former theologian, spoke of the beginning of a beginning. But Rana remained cautious regarding further developments. Others went further and wanted, as they felt, set aside, aside the package of tradition as an unnecessary compromise and leaping over almost 2,000 years of church history to interpret the church doctrine anew on the basis of scripture. They felt that after the first stage rocket had been ignited by the council, it was now time for the second stage. But the second stage rocket soon looked like a spaceship beyond the reach of ground control. <laughs> the reaction was not long in coming. It did not come only from the fraternity of St. Pius X, founded by Archbishop Marshall Lefebvre. It came also from theologians who had been counted among the progressives at the Council. Jacques Maritain, Louis Bouillet, Henri de Lubac. Unlike Lefebvre, they did not criticize the Council itself, but its reception. Joseph Ratzinger, who as a young theologian had played a significant part in the council as a peritus, had struck a cautionary note already at the first German Catholic assembly after the council in Bamberg in 1966. As cardinal, he arrived as a one whole critical evaluation of the post-conciliar situation in his report, The Situation of the Face, in 1985. And with good reason. In the first two decades after the council, an exodus of priests and members of orders had taken place. In any, many spheres, there was a noticeable decline in ecclesial praxis and protest movements had arisen among both laity and priests, above all after the encyclical Humane Vitae on the transmission of human life. Pope Paul VI spoke of the smoke of Satan that had penetrated into the temple of God through some kind of cracks. Some critics went so far as to consider the council as an accident and the greatest catastrophe in recent church history. But it would be a knee-jerk reaction to consider that everything that happened after the council happened because of the council. <laughs> the critiques fail to recognize the long-term trends in religious sociology, which were taking effect even before the council, and which erupted in the social upheavals connected with the student and youth pro protests in, of 1968 from San Francisco to Paris, Frankfurt, and Berlin. The emancipatory tendencies of that time 
het al consequences in se ecclesial realm. The progressives during the council were in fact the true conservatives. They turned back to the older traditions in order to break up the later incrustations. But now, progressives of a new kind began to speak out. They did not take their orientation so much from the earlier tradition, but from the science of the times, and wanted to interpret the gospel with a view of humanity today in the changed social situation. This is in principle legitimate for the council itself, but it becomes problematic if the doctrine of the faith threatens to become a doctrine of a purely secular salvation, as occurred in some, the underline in some, not in all forms of liberation theology. The extraordinary synod of bishops in 1985 had the task of drawing the balance 20 years after the end of the council. This led to a third phase of reception. The second was aware of the crisis, but the, the synod was aware of the crisis, but did not want to join in the widespread lamentation. They spoke of an ambivalent situation in which besides the unmistakable negative aspects, increasing secularization and the worrying superficiality, as well as the ideological reinterpretation of the faith, there were also many good fruits of the Council. The liturgical renewal, which led to a greater emphasis on the Word of God and to a more active participation of the whole celebrating congregation, the ecumenical rapprochements, the opening up to the modern world and its culture, and much more. In principle, the Synod emphasized that the Church was the same in all councils, and the last council was to be interpreted in the context of all other councils. With this principle, the Synod became a crystallization point for the third phase of reception, the magisterial reception. The first official step towards reception was the liturgical reform, above all the introduction of the new missal, which came into force on the first Sunday of Advent 19, 1970. This reform was accepted with gratitude by the overwhelming majority of the faithful, but it also encountered criticism, partly for theological reasons, but partly also because many missed the sacrality and the aesthetic of the previous rite. Benedict XVI, therefore, in 2007, permitted the use of the pre so-called preconciliar rite once more as an extraordinary form. That solved some problems, but gave rise to new problems, which must now be dealt with the new pontificate. One further step was that Pope John Paul II in 1983 promulgated the new Code of Canon Law initiated by John XXIII with the intention of translating the conciliar doctrine of the Church into canonical language and legal forms. Some can canonists understand the new Code as the ultimate magisterial interpretation of the Council a position I hardly, hardly can share, because canon law, as important it is, treats only with institutional and not with the inner and mystic aspect of the Church, which was fundamental for the Council Conciliar Renewal. Others criticize the fact that in spite of many improvements, the new canon law lags behind the Council, for example, in the question of collegiality and participation of the laity, and has not fully received the Council. Finally, in 1992, on the 30th anniversary of the opening of the Council, Pope John Paul II published the Catechism of the Catholic Church, 
initiated by the Synod of 1985. He understood the Catechism as a contribution towards the renewal of ecclesial life as it was intended by the introduced and introduced by the Second Vatican Council. This official phase of reception without door led to a consolidation of the ecclesial situation. It has in the meantime, however, reached its limits. The Council unleashed, unleashed a dynamic which goes on and calls for a further step in the realization of the conciliar agenda within a world in rapid change. Let us ask why. Where do we stand now after three phases of reception? <coughs> this is now the third point, light and shadow in the post-conciliar situation. In the first place, one should acknowledge, in spite of the widespread discontent, that there is no lack of positive aspects. The council documents are not dead letters. They have shaped the life of the dioceses, parishes, and local communities through the renewal of the liturgy as well as through a stronger biblically based spirituality and the active participation of the laity and stimulated ecumenical and interreligious dialogue. It has led to a charismatic renewal. The multiplicity of charisms and the general call to holiness were given a new radiance and many evangelicals in the original meaning of the word elements concerns were taken up. There are attentive observers of church development who predict a future evangelical Catholicism. Nor did the official reception stand still. To some extent, it went above and beyond the Council. That occurred, for example, in the case of the liturgical reforms. The Council had still retained the Latin language as a rule for liturgical change and had not yet discussed the orientation of the direction of the celebration towards the people. It is similar also in the case of the implementation of the religious freedom proclaimed by the Council and after uh, debates and of the policy of human rights with which John Paul II made an essential contribution to overcoming the communist dictatorship in Eastern Europe. The encyclical Ud Udum Sint, 1995, the first ecumenical encyclical ever, added depth to the ecumenical statements of the Council and took them further energically. The various interreligious prayer encounters at Assisi extended the interreligious dialogue prompted by the Council. All of that has brought positive change to the face of the Church, both within and without. At the same time, the shadows must be also mentioned. Many of the impulses given by the Council have so far only been implemented half-heartedly, such as the significance of the particular Church, the collegiality of the Episcopate, the shared responsibility of the laity, especially the role of women in the Church, and in contrast, the centralism of the Curia has increased. A series of recent events have also shown how much the Roman Curia is itself in urgent need of reform and modernization, a need clearly expressed by the congregation of cardinals preceding the last conclave now taken up by Pope Francis. Ecumenism, another important concern of the Council, has borne many good fruits more than could have been expected at the time of the Council. In the interim, a noticeable cooling off has occurred in the official conversations with the churches, both of the East and of the West. The causes are many and located on all sides. In the relationship with the churches of the Reformation, it has become clear that the different understanding of the Church 
results in a different understanding of the unity of the church. So that at large there remain inconciliable concepts of the goal of ecumenism, full communion in truth and love, or mutual recognition, so remaining differences. There are also pastoral problems, for example, ethical questions which directly touch to the real life of many of the faithful. Many of these questions have in fact led to a kind of horizontal schism between that which is taught as obligatory above and that which is actually practiced below and it's mostly silently tolerated. One must also mention the lack of priests which is becoming increasingly obvious in many particular churches, in many instances leading to a merger of parishes into a new kind of mega parish. Last but not least, the abuse crisis has led to a substantial loss of credibility of the church. Both laity and theologian have presented many concrete demands for reform. Some of these demands like the improvement of legal culture and transparency, merit consideration. Others, such as the ordination of women, cannot be accepted by the church, which is bound by the existing foundations of the faith. Other churches and communities, which have conceded to a large extent to such wishes, churches which have no pope, no curia, and no celibacy, which ordain women and grant their blessing to second and third marriages or same-sex partnerships, are no, no better off when it comes to making the gospel contemporary and moving people to faith. Obviously, the sustainability of the church does not in the first instance depend on these issues. On the contrary, a church that leans to the social mainstream becomes ambivalent in the literal sense of the word and in end superfluous. The church is interesting only when it stands up for its cause credibly and convincingly and gives voice to social criticism when it must. Further on, we can not envisage the future of the church only from a typical Western perspective and forget that many, many Christians suffering persecution and oppression in many other parts of our world. The blood of this Matthews is, as it was in the first Christian centuries, the seed of new Christians and of a new future of the church. They, living in the dark, are the very light of the church. Concluding this part of our reflection, we can state the lights and the shadows show that the impetus of the council is still far from being exhausted even 50 years after it was opened. So we have to ask what is a responsible way ahead beyond restorative and nostalgic dreams or utopian visions? In order to answer this question, we have to deal anew with the council documents. Many speak about the council and have never read the documents. <laughs> we should not turn the council into a myth or reduce it to a few cheap slogans. We should read the texts and ask for the adequate hermeneutic of the council, that is to look for the right method of interpreting it. Only then we can unearth and undiscover treasures of the council. Fourth point, in search for the council hermeneutic. Recently a vigorous debate has arisen regarding the question of the hermeneutic of the council, also the, the interpretation. All serious interpreters are agreed that it is not permissible to turn the council into a quarry of finding the required answers to every question. But at the same time, it is not permissible to cite some vague spirit of the council 
the starting point must be the council texts, and they must be interpreted according to the generally recognized rules and criteria for the interpretation of the council. It is crucial to extract the meaning of the conciliar statements carefully from its often complicated editorial history, and then to set that within the complex and tension-filled totality of all the council statements, and then to understand this totality in turn within the totality of the tradition and its historical development, as well as its subsequent reception. Finally, each individual statement must be interpreted within the framework of the hierarchy of truth that is from its Christological fundament and center. A council is, however, not an assembly concerned with the production and editing of documents. Each council has its place in a specific historical situation. It is an extraordinary event which occurs with which accrues symbolic significance. Such symbolic actions and symbolic events imprint themselves on the collective memory of the Church even more strongly and more deeply than the dogmatic formula which mostly are difficult to the average Christian to understand. So the simple fact alone that the Council Vatican II took place following Vatican I with its definition of the primacy and jurisdiction and the infallibility of the Pope has a symbolic significance. It makes it clear that the Church is not a monarchistic institution but is as communio, essentially concerned with communication. Therefore, in critical situations, the successors of the Apostles followed the example of the Jerusalem Apostolic Council in assembling in order to seek, under the leadership of Peter and the other Apostles, consensus in the Holy Spirit. But they did so, of course, with the involvement and the approval of the whole congregation. This could be an important indicator for the further progress of the reception of the Council. It is, under the leadership of the Magisterium, a matter for the whole people of God. Pope Benedict XVI initiated the latest phase of the Council hermeneutic in his address to the members of the Roman Curia on 22 December 2005. Following the Synod of 1985, he made it clear that consensus must not run only synchronically, that means referring to the present Church, but also diachronically, referring to the Church of all ages. In this sense, he contrasted two hermeneutics with one another, the hermeneutic of breaks and discontinuity, which he rejected, and the hermeneutic of reform and renewal. In this confrontation, it is important that the Pope did not, as often claimed, set the hermeneutic of discontinuity against the hermeneutic of continuity. The Pope did not speak of hermeneutic of continuity, he spoke of a hermeneutic of reform and of a renewal of the Church while maintaining continuity. This formula is important. It involves a continuity which does not simply repeat tradition, but means an innovative continuity which does not make the tradition look old, but proves it to be forever young. In the sense of Johann Adam Möller and John Henry Newman, it involves a living tradition which allows, allows the never consumed, always inexhaustible novelty news of Jesus Christ, as Irenaeus of Leon said. 
to constantly shine anew. The tradition is indeed, in the end, the work of the Holy Spirit, who leads the Church into all truth. When the Pope spoke of hermeneutic of reform, that means reform in the sense of the medieval tradition, not just the constantly necessary practical adaptation of individual paragraphs. Anyone who speaks of reform assumes that deficits and failings exist, which make it necessary to fulfill the prophetic and Jesuitic call to conversion, and to be aware that the Church is always in need of purification and must abidingly walk in the path of repentance, renewal, and reform, as it puts the Council itself. If Conquer, one of the most influential periti during the Council, therefore distinguished between the one tradition, in singular, and the many traditions, in plural, which give expression to the one tradition in an historically determined manner and must therefore be deepened, interpreted, and in part corrected again and again. In which direction such an interpretation can lead us, Pope Francis indicated already in the first days of his pontificate. He spoke of a poor church for the poor. This is, a, is, this is his hermeneutical key for Vatican II. For already the Council spoke in an unfortunately seldom quoted paragraph of Lumen Gentium that as Jesus cried, carried out the work of redemption in poverty and oppression, so the Church is called to follow the same path, not to set up to seek earthly glory, but to proclaim, and this by her own example in humility and self-denial, and by her cloneness to all those who are afflicted by human misery. <coughs> this reference to the cry of the poor recur in many, many instances and should give rise to an interpretation not ecclesiology self-centered, but open to those who in the Beatitudes of the Sermon of the Mount are called the Blessed. So Pope Benedict's address and Pope Francis' interpretation could help to rekindle the fire of the Council and give new force to the innovative impulse of the Council once more. According to an often quoted phrase from Thomas More, tradition is to pass on not the ashes, but the fire. So let us reflect in a final section what a new beginning in the footsteps of the Council could mean, where can and should we this path lead us. Also first, a new departure in the footsteps of the Council. In what follows, I can only suggest a few view viewpoints that seem important to me. The Council took up some important concerns of modernity in a critically constructive manner. Today, half a century later, we have moved from the modern to the postmodern era, which calls in question many of the ideals of the Enlightenment. The belief in progress and the, and the trust in reason of that time have been shaken. That does not mean that the Council is no longer relevant. On the contrary, the Christian faith, by its very nature, seeks understanding. It was Anselm of Canterbury who established the axiom fides querens intellectum. The faith is seeking for understanding. The Church must therefore continue to ask seriously the legitimate concerns of the modern age. Just as it defends the faith against postmodern pluralism and relativism, it must also defend it against anti-rationalist fundamentalist tendencies. Thus it becomes an ally 
in a quite unexpected way of a properly understood enlightenment, this viewpoint was important already for Pope John Paul II in his encyclical Fides et Ratio in 1998. And for Benedict XVI, it has become absolutely central. We dare not fall under the spell of a fundamentalistic or emotional or sentimental <coughs> understanding of the faith and withdraw into a falsely understood pious corner. We must give everyone an account, apologia, of the hope that is in us, as first Peter said. And in dialogue, argue as advocates for the faith. The church needs good theologians. A second point. Since the Second Vatican Council, the church has become universal in a new way. It is the one church of Jesus Christ and must make itself at home in varied and diverse cultures. The world in which we live is economically, technologically, and in its media a globalized world network. But a culturally and religious diverse world in which intolerable social differences persist and political and military conflicts lie in wait. The world today is afflicted by the plague of international terrorism and in many countries by a new wave of persecution of Christians. Following the evangelization of Europe in the first millennium, the evangelization of Africa and the two Americas in the second millennium, today in the third millennium, Asia, with its ancient advanced cultures and its growing economic and political power, is a great challenge. It's told me John Paul II several times, that confronts the church with a problem of unity and diversity in a totally new way. Unity through the Petrine office is a great good for us and a very gift from the Lord to his church. But advocating a center does not mean accepting excessive centralism. Already in 1963, still as a professor, Josef Ratzinger pointed out that unity in the Petrine office need not necessarily be understood as an administra administrative unity, but leaves room for a range of administrative, disciplinary and liturgical structures. In the encyclical Ut Unum Sin, Pope John Paul II proposed the consideration of new forms of exercise of papal primacy. That is of fundamental significance for the progress of ecumenical dialogue, but for the Catholic Church itself, it's also important a challenge for the uh, ecumenism with the Eastern, the Orthodox churches. The unity cannot be understood as anything but unity in diversity and diversity in unity. It is here that the core problem of the reception of the Council still remains unresolved. Third viewpoint. The problem of unity and diversity is epitomized today in the question of the freedom of each individual human being and each individual Christian. Kant, the famous uh, philosopher of modernity, defines the program of modern enlightenment in this way. Have courage to use your own reason. Today we often speak of individualization of life, choices and of faith. We speak of mature citizens and mature Christians. The Council addressed this issue in its statements on conscience. It defined conscience as a center and the sanctuary of humanity, in which the human being is alone with God and hears his voice in his inmost being. Josef Ratzinger again analyzed this statement very clearly already in 1968 and arrived to the conclusion 
that the council had not thought its statement through to the end. He was of the opinion that one should follow the problem further in the footsteps of John Henry Newman. Newman concludes his famous letter to the Duke of Norfolk as follows. Certainly, if I am obliged to bring religion after, into after-dinner toasts, which indeed does not seem quite the thing, I shall drink to the Pope, if you please, still to the conscience first and to the Pope afterwards. <laughs> For Newman, who is now gratified, for Newman, the conscience is a real representative of Christ. The place where the authority of the church reaches is eternal limits. The church cannot take the place of the personal conscience. On the other hand, the individual, in order to distinguish the quiet voice of God in us from the loud voices around us, must listen to the voice of the church and take note of what others before and beside him or her hear or have heard as a voice of God. In order to arrive to a, at a responsible decision, he or she must take advice while at the same time the formation of conscience and advice regarding it must become an important pastoral task. Following the informed, as we say, conscience is not the easy path on the broad highway of current opinion and, of the, and the applause of the masses. It will often be the narrow, steep and lonely path that is shown by the many martyrs of the past century, of our century and of the last century, who risked and gave their lives at the call of her, their conscience. The call of conscience is not an easy matter, but a very serious and often a deadly serious one. Conscience as an echo of the voice of God brings me to the final and most important point, the question of God. That seems to me today to be the fundamental question. The Council counted atheism in its various forms as one of the serious phenomena of this age. It also had enough humility to confess the share of blame Christians bear of the situation. Since then, the situation has intensified dramatically in our secularized Western world. The problem is not so much the theoretical atheism of the 19th century, nor the so-called new atheism, which proceeds from an ideology based on evolutionary theory and brain research. It is pra it's practical atheism, in fact, an indifference regarding the question of God. The secular option seems by now to be considered normal by many people. They are no worse than the average Christian. They live more or less like you and I, and they do not seem to feel that anything is lacking. But according to our understanding, something important is lacking. Thomas Aquinas calls it accedeia, what does not mean only laziness, but spiritual listlessness, a kind of sadness and desperation which does not reach the very measure of the human being. So we can no longer worry only about the social, cult, cultural and political effects of faith and take belief in God for granted. And above all, we cannot impress these new pagans with questions of internal church reform. These questions of church reform are interesting for insiders. But the people outside have other questions. They ask, where do I come from and where I am going? Why and for what purpose do I exist? 
how to find happiness. Why is there evil and suffering in the world? Why, why must I suffer? How can I come to terms with that and live with it? The present situation demands that we be theologians, theologians whose task is speaking of God, logos of theos, theologians. That is not a new agenda, but the agenda that one of the greatest theologians of Christianity, Thomas Aquinas, who said already in the 13th century, right at the beginning of his Summa Theologica, that the subject of theology was God and everything else insofar as it relates to God. In doing so, as Christian theologians, we must not speak vaguely about the divine being as all forms of religion do more or less. We must speak concretely of the God who has revealed himself in Jesus Christ as love, as God with us and for us, as God in infinitely merciful, who expects us, who in every situation concedes us a new chance, and to whom we can in all situations say, Abba, Father. We have to speak on the mercy, the misericordia, which is, as Pope Francis told, the name of our God. Without the personal foundation of faith, and without personal life born out of faith and committed in love and mercy for the poor, everything else leads nowhere. The old trench warfare between conservatives and progressives do not lead anywhere. Without a solid foundation and committed faith, everything else literally floats in the air. We must, in the first instance, awaken new faith, hope and love. We need a theocentric turning point in pastoral life. The joy of the Lord is our strength, said already the Old Testament prophet. To conclude, the council dare to take a step into a new era of church history. It did not point the way to a liberal conformist church, but to a church spiritually renewed from its sources, which is at the same time a church open to dialogue and engaged in the course of humanity. This path has not yet reached its end. We have perhaps not even completed half of the course. We have to continue along this path with patience and courage and overall with joy in order to overcome the sadness of the world. Joy is contagious, whereas laments are repulsive. When we renew the joy being church, the council wanted to set a light, then this joy will pass also to others and the church can proceed with a new prophetic power in a rapidly changing and profoundly insecure world. Then the church can be a compass and an encouraging sign of hope for many. This confident faith is was what we should learn from Vatican II. So we can engage in theology and form the church on the basis of a new joy in faith. For that goal, I wish to all of us, especially to the growing younger generation, above all strength, patience, courage, and joy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Eminence, for those words. Uh, not only 
about the origins of Vatican II, but the future as well. We have learned much. Now I'd like to invite uh, anyone and everyone to come up to either of the microphones for questions, please. First. <laughs> Students, now's your chance. This may not happen again. Please. Uh, I'm John Schultz. I'm a pastor in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. And uh, I had the opportunity to be in Rome during the four years of the council uh, as, a, as a theological student. Having said that, I had a thought during your talk, which I've never really thought of before, and that is, what was the chance, what were the odds that the council might not have turned out the way it did? For example, if Cardinals Taviani and Siri and Ruffini and Brown and some of the others had had much more of their way, if, uh, well, I won't go on. I just wondering, what was the chance that it may have happened much differently than what it did, the odds? I don't know. I just had that thought. I don't know what you can do with that. <laughs> the answer is not easy, also for me. But of course, something happened after the council. We had some progress also in church life, as I tried to uh, point out. But the council happened to, at the last time of a very optimistic period. It was the Kennedy era of the beginning 60s. But then came the years of 68. It was a big change in the whole atmosphere, especially in the Western world. And then it came the time of the breakdown of the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc. And so a new time, a new epoch started. And in this new epoch, well, the church must find, find their way ahead. And we could not only repeat the council in a textual sense, we had to try, uh, try, uh, interpret it in the new situation. This is one point. The second point, I think, also the change of ages, which happened in the meantime. The second point is, um, well, the reception of the church merged into a senseless battle between conservatives and progressives. The progressives who inter interpreted the council in a liberal sense which was not the intention of the council. The council wanted to go back to the sources, the Bible, or the old tradition of the first millennium, and, and use the church from the, its own sources. But the liberal wanted to adapt it to modern uh, life. And there were, on the other hand, very stubborn conservative or reactionary people who did not want any progress, or any step further, who had, had an understanding of tradition as a petrified. Uh, reality as the, uh, the Lefebriens. I met the theologians who had to discuss with the Lefebriens uh, after some two years ago. And they told me this was a penance for us, this discussion. <laughs> <laughs> why? Why? Well, the tradition meant for them the tradition of the 18th and 19th century. They had no idea of the, the, the theology of the fathers. They spoke about the, the mess, uh, the, la messe of uh, de toujours, uh, la messe of every time. But this mess of every time did not exist, that Jesus did not celebrate as we celebrate uh, as it was in the time right. There was a de uh, development of rights also during the Middle Ages. And therefore, there were two 
different concepts and the Hausdorff uh, fell in this pattern. I think we have to overcome this uh, uh, senseless uh, discussion today and turn to this conception of a living tradition as Pope Benedict XVI explained to us, a reform and renewal within the continuity, but it's a living continuity, not a static reality. And so if we think now at the beginning of the third millennium, uh, we uh, enter in a new stage of reception of the council. But that's not the first time that post-conciliar times are very difficult and complex. It happened also after the Tridentine Council. It needed 100 years till the texts of the council were published in France. <laughs> so, so we are in a very positive uh, situation <laughs> in comparison with, uh, with the Tridentine Council. But uh, myself, I look with hope in the future. But no, the truth of the gospel will also, all the time find objections and aggressions. This is the way of the church has to uh, go and uh, through all this, uh, through our history. And we have to do today what we can do to fulfill the intention of the council. And I have the hope that the new pontificate will give, uh, guide us a step further. Thank you. We have a question over here. Hello. Um, I'm in the Master of Divinity program here at Notre um, Dame. And I um, was wondering, you talk about the way of responsibility. And um, as you talk about continuing this reform, what you see the responsibility of lay people is in helping the church do reform. Does that make sense? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> The responsibility of lay people is to uh, live according to their baptism. It's a call, uh, it's a baptism, it's a confirmation also. That's the fundament of lay responsibility to keep their faith, to de deepen their own faith, and to give witness of their faith in their concrete context of family, of uh, university, and where they are, to give witness of their faith. The second one is to use a means of uh, holiness, of sanctification, the sacraments to celebrate with the whole congregation, especially the pastoral mystery of the Eucharist, and then to be missionaries. missionaries. Of course, they have a, a responsibility for the life of the church, and I think we can, uh, could go a step further to give more responsibility to lay people. I cannot not speak about the American uh, situation so much, but in our German situation, priests are burdened uh, with many administrative uh, duties. I think we're often lay people were much more able to do it, uh, with, to do with money and with uh, organization. They are trained to do it, the priests are not so much, and so far they can be given much responsibility also to lay people without uh, in any way to minimize the responsibility of the pastor which is given by his ordination. But, and this is very important, we should not think that uh, the lay responsibility would be fully realized when it becomes a, a kind of uh, uh, a, a clerical, a clericalization of laity. This should be the wrong way. We, we do not want a secularization of priests, but not a clericalization of lay people. They have different responsibilities, but I think uh, this responsibility of, the, of laity can be uh, developed uh, in the future and uh, given more room and I think uh, also, the new pope uh, pushes in this uh, direction he did and when he was in Buenos Aires a lot to, uh, uh, to deepen and to uh, uh, improve lay responsibility. And I have the impression he will do it also on the level of the universal church. But the main call, I've forgotten now, is the call to holiness. 
And that's the same for priests and for lay people. And I think that's a real measure we must uh, keep in, in our minds and our hearts, the, key, the call to holiness. And when you study a little bit the history of the church, and the history of the church is also the history of saints, we can find there are many, many saints of women, holy women, who had a, ma a lot of influence in church history, in the church spirituality, without being part of any kind of a hierarchy. And so I think this call to holiness is the most important thing we have to support today. Great, thank you. Thank you very much for your, for your talk, Cardinal Kessler. Um, during your talk, you mentioned um, how the church has struggled with unity and diversity in its governance um, since Vatican II, and also how collegiality you know, remains something yet to be implemented fully from the Council. And you also mentioned that, uh, that Pope Francis you know, has importantly referred to himself as the Bishop of Rome, and you know, recently we've all heard about the, the eight group of eight partners that he's got together. I wondered if you had any um, concrete any, any ideas or vision about concrete ways in which the church could continue to move forward in implementing a fuller vision of collegiality? Well, I think uh, Pope Francis did a very important step to he called now uh, uh, a group of eight cardinals from the different continents to give him advice. Uh, for the reform of the Curia, of, the, of Penn Law, and so it's a very important step, which realizes also the church today is no longer a European church. The church is a universal church and is growing very much in the southern hemisphere. And so he called the cardinals from every continent to give him advice. He will have the last word. Of course, nobody denies it, but uh, well, the world is so complex today and so difficult. There is a globalization there, but on a very, very superficial level only. In the deeps of the hearts, there are the old uh, traditional uh, concepts and the styles of life. Um, uh, some months ago, I was in Korea again, and very moderated theologian and priest told me that you in Rome do not understand our culture. And of course, it's true. It was said four times now, in, or very often in Asia. It's a different kind of uh, mentality of spirituality. And uh, therefore, one person, even if he's the Pope, cannot see all the different aspects. He needs this uh, collegial advice. That's one point. And then the second point, we can strengthen the responsibility of the synods of bishops which is installed already by Paul VI, and you can strengthen also the role of the consistory of the cardinals. So you could have two houses, the house of uh, synod of um, bishops and the house of the cardinals, giving advice, advice to the pope, and I think this both um, um, uh, bodies have to be strengthened in the future, and the third point would be well, to reflect uh, uh, too much of uh, centralization which occurred after the council and give more room for the divine institution, divine institution of the bishop. It's not a, a question of discipline. The bishop, uh, episcopacy is divinely instituted and to the uh, local church and especially to the bishop's conferences, we cannot uh, regulate everything uh, to a common uh, measure in such a complex world. These are some points which are possible, and I have the impression Pope Benedict, uh, Pope uh, Francis, take the, the, the always Bishop of Rome. He avoids the term Pope. He is Pope, of course. But a Bishop of Rome, it means uh, it's very important also for the relation with the Orthodox uh, churches who uh, emphasize uh, this uh, precise point. That's it. Your Eminence. Yeah. Uh, I'm, uh, my name is Marcus Sells. I'm a graduate student, a PhD program at the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. Um, in your conclusion, in speaking of future perspectives, it struck me that the, the unifying point was dialogue, dialogue between um, 
uh, local churches, dialogue of consciences, dialogue between God and human beings, dialogue among theologians. Um, in your own, uh, initi initiating your own theological dialogue, you began with uh, a dialogue with the 19th century Tumingers and the idealists, the Roman, the, sorry, the German idealists in Schelling. Um, uh, whom do you see as the, the promising dialogue partners uh, today in terms of, uh, say, for, for somebody in my position uh, working on uh, studies in theology? Uh, you are asking about uh, the partners in philosophy or such kind of, but that's a very difficult uh, question because we have no universal philosophy at this time and the philosophies are very different and also in the Western world there is a, di a quite different between the states and the European situation also Europe is in itself divers diversified. <laughs> I think it's the, one of the main deficits of our time that there is not a um, how do you say in English, an emerging, a ruling, or overall recognized philosophy explaining uh, what the sensibility of our times. When I studied, it was uh, uh, existentialism, Heidegger, uh, or Jaspers, and these people. And then for a short time, it was the uh, Frankfurter Schule, uh, the School of Frankfurt. Uh, but now, what it is? Mm -hmm. We do not have this uh, kind of philosophy, and this deficit in philosophy is also a deficit for systematic theology. We must see these problems that we have this postmodernism. But what does it mean, postmodernism? So it's not so clear. So far I cannot give a very concrete answer. But but one point would also be to be in contact with traditional great philosophers. And therefore I uh, made the choice for Schelling, it's not the easiest one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but was there, uh, one great philosopher of modernity or of the past, uh, Thomas Aquinas is always important in the time of Austin, so, and to learn from them how to think through uh, uh, faith. And therefore, it does, it's not so, as a matter this or one, you can take Thomas Aurel, you can take Bonaventure, you can, and every great man, great thinker, you can take and you learn from it and then to trans, uh, tra translate it in our present situation. <laughs> but uh, the second point is also the dialogue between religions today. I think, uh, I thought that it was yes, the words of Pope uh, John Paul II, that Asia is a great. Uh, 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 see that, you know, what is challenge, a challenge today, and but to enter in what is Buddhism, what is Hinduism, is not an easy thing. And therefore the church was not very successful up to now. This is Asian high cultures, and I think this is also a very important uh, question to come into discussion with this religion, but it needs studies, you uh, cannot do it in a superficial Way. And the presupposition of all these dialogues outside, uh, these partners outside the church, is a dialogue within the Christian church, uh, between the Christian church and the ecumenical uh, dialogue, of course. And there are still open problems, it's not the clear case that all is already solved. But it, uh, the Christians must today stand together against a growing secularization and so for the ecumenical dialogue and the common ecumenical voice in fundamental question of faith is very important uh, today. So we have different levels of dialogue, not as a the dialogue within the Catholic Church itself. Thank you. We have uh, time for one last question. This would be the last. Sorry. Right. Since uh, the Second Vatican Council, uh, the Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church have you know, made great strides to come back together and refresh them all. What are your thoughts on incorporating Eastern theology with that of uh, the Roman Church and perhaps the reunion between the two churches? The Eastern Church is the Orthodox Church. 
Yes. 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 Oh yes, it was for me also a, a new thing because living in Germany there are not so many orthodox. <laughs> and so I knew only something about the manuals they have to study and to live in this. Because the fundament of every, especially ecumenical dialogue, is to build friendship, to build trust and personal relations. And it's not also always so easy with the patriarchate of most power at all. <laughs> where the dialogue must be very clear also. This is a, this is the only thing they understand. <laughs> and therefore, also the, but the dialogue with the Eastern Church is a very rich one because they represent an old apostolic tradition. And Vatican II is saying in the, uh, in the decree on ecumenism that from the first, from the beginning, the first century already, there were different traditions which are not contradictory but complementary. And I think this complementarity between East and West we lost to a high degree in the second millennium. And so I think the promise of the third millennium is that the two parts of the one church, which are almost in full communion, this is the world of Benedict XVI, we are not in full, but almost in full communion. We have this same credo, we have the same seven sacraments, we have the veneration of the saints many as a, a episcopal uh, and sacramental uh, understanding of the church. I think this is a very important, it's very enriching. And everybody uh, likes and appreciates today also the icons of the Eastern Church. And this shows also for somebody who is not a theologian can enter in all these texts the richness of spirituality which is there in the Eastern uh, churches, and I think we, it's very important to come to a common understanding. The main point, of course, is the Petrine office. I said Petrine in a ministry, but I say. And, but uh, for, for me, it's the strength of the Catholic Church to have this pit, the rock of Peter, and to be attached to it, and to have a center, and it gives also unity to the church. But we have to, ex uh, to reflect to discuss with them how Petra ministry can be exercised concretely in the East and in the West. We cannot impose our Western system, uh, which grew up in the second millennium, to the Eastern churches. There must be a differentiated way of exercise of the Petra ministry. Uh, with Constantinople, I could go a very long way already. <laughs> and we were, yes, we were very close sometimes. Uh, Zizoulas, the famous theologian uh, of the Petrarchate, came to me. I wrote him a letter, as I understand it, <coughs> privately. And he came to me, oh, 80, 90%, I agree with you. That's a lot, 80, 90%. <laughs> <laughs> it's all lot. And so it's a uh, possibility to have a conception, to come together, and uh, well, there are still problems in this Eastern Church. We have to understand, we have to accept and to tolerate also, but we have to go on. I think this would simply also a help for better understanding with our Protestant friends. Mm -hmm. Both dialogues uh, belong together, they are not uh, one against the other, but we come to a new exercise of uh, Petra in ministry, helps and also to come uh, uh, along uh, with uh, Protestants. And I think this is very important in our world today to go on in the ecumenical dialogue. There are phases which it goes well, and there are phases where it is more difficult. All life is in this way, but uh, we have to go on with the mandate of our Lord. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.